Hi, everybody. How are you? My name is Ryan Anderson, and I'm the Associate Dean for Business and Entrepreneurship here at Mohawk College. Welcome back to uh, the next phase of the fourth annual MindShift Conference. Uh, very lucky today to have Stephen Aikman with us. Stephen is, is part of our Mohawk College Board of Directors, is also a Mohawk alumni, which I think is the most important part of today's discussion, but also is, is a notable entrepreneur, uh, one that is that is known not so much just throughout Canada, but also worldwide now as well. Uh, you may have seen his, his, his skincare line, you may have seen him on Amazon, uh, a fantastic story of, of, of courage to change, courage to change course, uh, is also Curves to grow as we move along as well, and knowing that an entrepreneur is never really done, both in their own vision and their own learning. So uh, without further ado, Stephen, I, I'd love to say hi to you, and, and maybe you can let our audience know a little bit more about, about where you've been, where you're at, and, and also where you're going. Oh, well, first of all, thank you, Ryan. Um, I, I really, when I got a phone call from you to say what'll be part of this conference, I was like, yes, because I don't think you realize how much uh, I'm affiliated and, and love Mohawk College. Um, uh, it was a long time ago. Uh, I'd, I'd probably date myself, but it, it was 30 years ago when, when I was there. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, it was the best experience I had. And so for the opportunity to kind of circle back in my life and uh, share a little bit about my last 30 years, it's an absolute honor and privilege. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Stephen. And I know, you know, you and I have spoken a few times and your, you know, your willingness to become involved in, in, in some of our center activities, as well as most importantly, to help our student entrepreneurs learn more. Um, I always find that, that nothing helps our students more than just practical stories and real life stories about successes, but also screwing up and also taking steps back too. And that's something that, that we've all had to do in our careers. So um, thank you for that, Stephen. Um, can we get started a little bit by talking a little bit about, about those early days? Um, you know, maybe a bit about what your company is. You're, you're the expert to tell them. Um, what were those early days like? Why did you decide to leave, which, which I know was a very lucrative job as well, uh, when you did yep. take that step? Um, and then we'll get into a little bit later on about, about you know, the growth of your company as well. Sure. I'll, I'll just start off with sort of the, the, the 10,000 feet level and then we can wind her down a bit. But at the top of the, 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 the clouds there, is, I've been very fortunate for the last uh, close to seven years now of, of owning two companies. And, and one of them is called All Natural Advice. And uh, it's a all natural skincare organic that, that we make here in Oakville, Ontario. Um, and in 2014, I started this journey. And uh, I'm going to tell you up front. I knew absolutely nothing about skincare. I mean, uh, the only thing I know is that, uh, that my wife uses and she looks beautiful. I, I figured this stuff has got to work. And uh, in 2014, I, I'll get into some details, but essentially I started with $1,000. And I knew that there was a market opportunity and I knew there was um, a different way that we could actually uh, share our experience of our, of our product um, through more of an e-channel type of business. And that's important because in 2014, e-channel was important, but there's still a lot of bricks and mortar. And so as I go through this journey in the next five to seven years, um, the company that I own became the, the top selling skincare brand on Amazon Canada, which is incredible because 70% of all Canadians actually go on Amazon to buy. So here I'm sitting now uh, competing against some of the, the top uh, beauty brands in all of Canada. And I'm sitting side by side with them and I'm beating them. And so I took that journey and I started to say, hey, if I can do this in Canada, why can't I do this in other countries? And once you learn the model, once you learn how to interact with a client differently through sort of that e-commerce perspective, that, and that, that model can be easily duplicated. And so I expanded it into um, the UK and then I said, I can do this now in other countries, went into Germany, Italy, France, uh, Spain, Poland, Netherlands, we're number one in Australia and um, continue to grow in with the United States as well. So now uh, in over, I think 11 different countries, um, obviously Canada is still our, 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 our flagship, let's call it, um, but um, took that thousand dollars, became number one in Canada and recently sold the company for uh, just more than $10,000, sorry, $10 million. Uh, so it was a quite success and I, I still have an opportunity to be with them and now we're growing it to a hundred million dollar company. That's incredible. And you know, the skincare line is one of the most competitive industries that we have in, in, in our beauty products right now as well, yep. isn't it? To, to do that at a time when most 
historically have been brick and mortar, have been in shopping, uh, you know, shoppers drug mart or things like that to take that step. Um, how is how did an online presence like Amazon really allow you to get to different markets? Um, and but also, were there some barriers that Amazon also presented too? Yeah, so actually a really good question. So let's kind of pause for a second because I think you always talk about market opportunity. There is, you know, two things you can do. You can go out, you can create a new widget, but if people don't know about that new widget or what problem it solves, it's hard to actually market it and sell it. But when you got a market that's out there looking for, um, and in my case, uh, they wanted to have, they want beauty, they want skincare. But where I identified was there wasn't anything that was a local, there wasn't a Canadian brand. I also recognized that there wasn't anything that was truly organic and, and, and more of that natural uh, ingredients. And so the market opportunity, I didn't necessarily have to go and create a market. I just had to uh, make sure that I created a better brand and a better product that spoke to clients looking for it. So my demographics were at the time a little bit older, like 35 to about 70. Female was by far uh, in terms of who was buying a product at the time, but that's starting to shift a, a great deal now. Um, but for me, if you think about beauty, right? And, and I'm not trying to say, what was your grandmother's beauty brand? What I'm trying to say is, uh, what, is what is the up-to-date one? Then what's the ones that you would, you would look at and buy? And, but when you did that, you often went to a store because you wanted to smell it. You wanted to feel it. You wanted to put it on your, your face. And if you like the tester, you maybe would buy it. But when you're looking at going towards uh, or shifting your distribution channel to purely an omni-channel, to going to uh, uh, more of a uh, uh, distribution of, of e-commerce, um, you have to create a different buying experience, especially with a product that people are used to touching and feeling and smelling. And so you do that by creating a very instant connection with that client. So what I discovered through channels like Amazon or Walmart or eBay or other things, client wants, they need to have that instant, I know you're there. I need to know if I have a question, I can answer within seconds. And so what was important is the ability for me to communicate um, with clients in a very fast and effective way. And for clients to also, you know, it's very, I think, you know, we all think reviews are important, they're probably the most important thing, is that a client needs to be able to read that review and understand, okay, I get what, a peer of mine is, is what, they read, what they talk about it. And you read consistently about those and, and then they, the person kind of gets to feel. And so that was one of the most important things was creating an online buying experience that a client felt very engaged to. Um, they, they, you know, the, the marketing part of, of, of being Canadian, being local, um, being organic was extremely important. And I think that Canadian clients in particular wanted to support that. So, um, you know, you're probably familiar, Ryan, when you try to take additional product and, and get into um, Walmart, the, the physical bricks and mortar or Loblaws, that shelf space is very expensive to compete in. And as a manufacturer, you've got to have really deep pockets, um, very long terms in order to, uh, to get into that space. But when you go to an e-commerce, e-channel, your, you don't, your inventory can be a lot smaller. So you don't have to carry million dollars worth of inventory. You can carry smaller batches. Um, you can do more just in time inventory um, fulfillment. So you, know, you, you take advantage of, of, of Amazon's programs such as fulfillment by Amazon, where you send product into their warehouse. Uh, you still own the inventory, um, but you leverage their experience of delivery. And so that logistics goes away. So, Again, your e-channel, you don't have to wear a thousand hats like you used to. You can focus on what you do best and, and that is uh, connecting with the client and, and, and making, sure, um, making sure that experience is still just as amazing if they walked into a store. It, it, it's interesting, I, I go back to what you said about the experience because I, I think that's really important you know, in, in today's um, buying environment, if you will. Uh, I was reading an article a couple of weeks ago about the fact that, you know, one of the biggest hurdles that people had when the pandemic started was that they couldn't experience what they would always experience with their, with their buying methods. And they couldn't go to a store like they used to, and they didn't have out of the inventory or their stores weren't open. And so as a result, you had people 
Um, you know, I, I can look back, Steve, when I taught my mother how to purchase something on Amazon because she had no idea, but she had to buy Christmas presents, didn't she? And so, so as a result, we spent three hours going through how you go buy those things on Amazon. And the article was interesting and then it said that, that it really has forced people to be a lot more literate when it comes to consumerism digitally than they did before, which, which I guess funnels really well into, into where your space was as well. I guess the question I have for you, though, is, you know, how have you managed to duplicate that customer experience to make them feel like they were able to see, touch and feel like, like they wanted to do when they actually were in the storefronts? Uh, so, so one of the things about these different omni channel, the different marketplaces, you'd say, like the Amazon, Walmart, um, they, what's, what, what we have to do is a couple of things. You, you got to take away your, your, your small business mentality. OK, because as a small business, sometimes you start and let's think about if you own a mom and pop store and someone walks in and they want to return something and they take it personally. Like, oh, why? You, and they give you a hard time about returning that item. Well, what you have to put is a different hat on when you go through these different channels. So um, remember, it, it, I, I'm 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 getting viewed by hundreds of thousands of people every single day. Their, their eyeballs are going to my product. And if they buy my product um, and they, uh, they have that uh, physically now get shipped to them, um, if something goes wrong, um, as, a, as, a, we're, we're, as a seller, um, what's a couple of things important? Number one, treat that client as if they're face-to-face, -face, like right in front of you, okay? Uh, don't question them. If they don't like it, they don't like it, okay? Um, return it, give their money back to them. It's okay. Um, our return rate is actually less than 2%. So in the big scheme of things, that's tiny. And you know, take and don't ever blame other people. If, if, it, if the delivery guy smashed a bottle by accident, the client's still upset at the other, still at the other end of that tra transaction is a client. And so you always have to think about that. So I always looked at it as client is king. Um, you know, everyone's always taught you that. I learned that in, in the bank that I was at. The client's the most important thing. And if you do the right, if you do the right activities, if you treat that client well, you will get rewarded. So you're not going to win every client, and some clients will be upset. But over the long term, um, you actually win. So to me, I think it was when you, and I think reviews online is very, very important too. We actually like getting negative reviews. Now I'll tell you why I, I say that. Um, uh, many times we would launch a new product or we would launch a, diff a batch and also now get some, uh, the product is leaking or I don't like the smell or something went wrong. And then we realize, oh my goodness, um, we had a, a manufacturing error or when we launched the product, it should have used a different smell or that scent was too strong when it was developed. And so those reviews, when you read them very quickly, those negative ones, use that to course correct. And that's the most important thing in this world is that you have the chance to course correct and course correct fast. So then you quickly change up the inventory, change whatever needs to be done. And so then pivoting very fast um, in an online business is important. Listing the clients very important and getting that feedback and asking for that feedback is really important. I think too, Stephen, just to add to that, you know, if you've got people right now that are hesitant to move from a brick and mortar shopping experience environment to a digital one, one of, one of the biggest concerns is how do I return something? You know, what is that step? Because if you've got those hurdles to participating in the market, you really have them as far as, as far as that stage goes. One of the things we've really tried to talk to our businesses about is, is, the importance of those negative reviews actually catapulting you to show customer service and to go and say, you know, it used to be that they would teach you not to respond to those things because, you know, focus on the positive. Now you want to, because you want to show that we had that hurdle, but we went over and above to make sure that person was happy. Because as a consumer, if I read that, I start to feel comfortable that if there is a problem, I'm not going to be left with something I can't use or enjoy. And I think that's a fantastic point you made to, to show our audience that, you know, in a digital environment, you can have that consumer relationship much like you had in a brick and mortar one as well. And never, never take anything personally. I mean, yeah. when a client gets upset, listen, they're not getting set up with Steve Aiken. They're upset at the situation. So never, ever take it personally. Especially these days. Especially yeah. oh, these yeah. days when we're competing with so much more. I, I want to go back. You know, you said something at the beginning that, that I, I made a note on. You said that you were never the expert in your product. And and. It's, it's funny, you know, some of the things Stephen will talk about with people, you know, you know, 
young entrepreneurs get involved in businesses because it is easier to start now in a gig economy where you know you can have a cell phone you can start a business often we see young entrepreneurs will get involved because they've got a passion or they've got a skill so whether it's gaming whether it's fashion whether it's something that they can do while they love and and to me as an entrepreneur if i can if i can make a business of a passion then i'm, I'm doing very well but we have others that that may not have a passion for the business, but they've got a business sense for a good product or a good market or a good opportunity. And I do think there are different streams there. How, but at the same time, that person, I would, I would, I'm sure you would agree, would have to become knowledgeable in that industry enough to, to not become the biggest obstacle, <laughs> I guess, as well. So, you know, taking, taking into consideration what you said about not being a, a, a skincare expert, if you will, how did you learn enough to to be able to help your business but also know that there are areas that you just had to pass off to experts and, and that's okay so i think the first thing i'd recommend is get mentors get people that are experts in certain things as, as a business owner you're going to wear many many hats um, what you want to do is you want to focus on the things that are most impactful so what is the most impactful thing to your business uh, for me, the impactful part was the marketing. It was the, um, the distribution, getting things all set up. And I'll, and I'll get into a bit more because I think um, I do want to talk a bit about compliance and, and a bit about uh, taxes and, 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 and uh, government regulations. Those are things that can trip you up. But when it comes to in terms of the product, um, you know, I was able to work with this, uh, uh, someone who was an expert in that business. And so partnering with that individual who was physically making those products, um, they're the ones that I relied on. They're the ones that I would ask, so what do I need in terms of ingredients? How, how does all this work? And so I just surrounded myself with an expert. Um, but I, I, to this day, I'll never say it. I, I'll, I still say I, I really don't understand the, the nuances of that particular uh, uh, maybe ingredient, but I, I would understand the general direction that I'm going to go and I leave it up to the mentors or to the experts that I rely upon uh, for the information. Interesting. So you essentially became a student of your product while you're developing your product. Absolutely. I love that. And that, and that to me is a great, uh, is, is, you know, that is a fantastic example for our, for our, our, our viewers of this is, is to know that you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to make sure that you get them. And whether that's yourself from learning, you know, uh, you know, we look at a lot of entrepreneurs, Stephen, that, that they may be fantastic in the skill that they want to bring to that business, but they don't keep books very well. They don't have legal insight. They don't have a lot of those things that, that you may need to run a business that you learn about afterwards, don't you? And uh, that's okay. And I, we always will say as an entrepreneur, you are your most important and you are your best and often your worst employee when you get started. And you have to make sure that you develop that employee in yourself as well to make sure that, uh, that you can represent your business well. I, I want to tag on to that. I think you're bang on. Um, the word that I often use is resilient. And, and, and if, if you as a business owner you're going to hit roadblocks. You're going to come into something that you just don't understand or you made a decision that was wrong. But being resilient is, and how do I course correct? How do I over get around that barrier? Or who do I need to contact to help me to get around that barrier, right? Um, when I started in 2014, I made so many mistakes when I out of the gate. Uh, I couldn't even tell you. There, there was... Uh, this is one of the biggest things which I will share with you is when I decided to launch into um, the UK, I started on my own thinking, okay, I understand how the, the, the government regulations in terms of taxation works and I understand there's a VAT. And, but in my mind, I thought it was there was thresholds in the UK that once you hit those thresholds, just like you need HST in Canada, there would be a certain threshold for, um, for the VAT. Well, what I didn't was the fine print, and the fine print was, uh, unless you're a uh, overseas or international seller, you've got to collect on day one. So what happened with me is I had launched, was doing really, really well. And when I priced out my, my product in the UK, I, I knew the cost of delivery, I knew my selling fees, I knew the product cost. Um, I just assumed too, when I sold the product to the client, again, my, my uh, naiveness when it comes to Canada, we always charge... HST on top. Well, in Europe, no, Europe's always included in the price. So what was happening was that HS or the VAT was, was coming off the actual price. So a couple of years later, all of a sudden I get a, a knock on the door or a phone call or an email and it was, 
Uh, hello, sir. This is the UK government. Um, we're just here to uh, talk a bit about your last little couple years of selling. And then I kind of went, oh, my God. Um, and of, of course, uh, what I didn't realize was all those years that I was, uh, sh should have been, in my mind, collecting and remitting uh, or collecting, like charging higher price so I could collect. It was, I should have been collecting. So two years worth of margins wiped out. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, I, I hit the reset button, wrote a big check to the government and uh, moved on. Right. Wow. So. <laughs> Those are things that happen that you'll learn. It was funny. I was going to ask you about, about the biggest, your biggest failure and what you've learned. <laughs> I, I, maybe that, that, maybe you just answered that question without me asking, I suppose. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I, it, um, that was probably one of the biggest ones. Um, I think, uh, I would say, I'm just trying, there was a lot of small ones. I think, again, understanding the, 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 the compliance regulations are very important in, in, the, in, in the, the countries that you're going into. Um, everyone has different compliance. So for, for me, I'm regulated by Health Canada. Um, all our products need to be uh, licensed through the Cosmetic Act. And I moved into Europe, it's gotta be licensed through the EU Cosmetic Act. So I, you certainly have to keep an eye on, cause I think, you know, as you, there's absolutely marketing is important follow but you need to follow the regulations of the different different countries as well so um and i think the other big thing is is don't worry about distribution in terms of logistics like i can ship product to australia just as easy as i can ship it to vancouver um, i can get it into to germany just as easy as i can get into halifax so um, I wouldn't, those are, those are important things you have to know, the hat you have to wear, but don't think just Canada, think globally, because you know, right now, again, there's what, 35, 37 million Canadians. Um, that's a lot of people. That's great. Um, love every one of them, but there's a few billion out there in the world. Right. And, and so how do you then go out and attract, uh, the billions of clients like Canada absolutely is our flagship but the market opportunity is global. And, and knowing how to take that, um, like we recently just launched in uh, a Tmall global account uh, in China, and it's really interesting. It was probably one of the most stressful launches that we've done, but uh, 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 the, uh, the one thing I know about the, the, the market in China is that they want Canadian product and, and they're willing to pay a premium. And so when you go through um, really strict regulations to open up, um, into that marketplace. Once you get there, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. And, and it's one that we've, we're already starting to see it grow immensely. It's incredible, you know, and maybe that in itself speaks so much about how our world has changed too. I mean, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm really surprised that an entrepreneur would say, don't worry about distribution because that sometimes in our, in our formal teaching, that's one of the first things we'd say is, you know, perfect your distribution channels, uh, make sure that you're making the right calls. But I think in our new environment, in our new digital environment, you don't, you don't have a lot of barriers, do you? I mean, sure, you've got the tax implications and you've got some of the logistical things, but you don't. I mean, you know, you, Amazon isn't ever going to go and say it's .ca, there's .com and everywhere else. So it's, it's interesting that you would say that. That's a, a real big learning experience uh, for me as well, because I never would have thought that. I never would have thought that, that you don't really have those walls. Uh, that's, that's a no. great point. In fact, we're just launching uh, into Brazil um, and to India, which is a huge market, uh, especially for the middle income. That growth is, is just phenomenal. Um, and uh, Europe continues to grow. Um, so, I mean, again, if, if you start thinking, again, that global and don't worry about the barriers, because there, there are not, in my opinion, there's very little. So I'd like to ask you a question and, and probably a bit of a curveball, because it's something I always like to, to ask entrepreneurs it's a it's a glamorous gig it's also a a unglamorous gig it's it's something that you know you go to bed at night feeling good and you also go to bed at night feeling absolutely horrible and, and I grew up with a family of them and I was too and I always would say that you know we had dinner with mom and dad's business every single night and 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 that could be tough on the early goings isn't it how is how has this venture shaped you and how has it changed you um as a professional as an entrepreneur that's a good question. Um, maybe I'll take a step back because I didn't talk about both the, the, the previous 25 years. So I was getting uh, there to you and I, we do well with this. We should have more this all the time. This is fun. Yes. Uh, that so, was next. 
<laughs> well, because like, it kind of ties into it, right? Yeah. So, you know, I said earlier, I had, uh, I went to Mohawk in 90 to 93, and, and I think it was best experience. But in 93, there was, the economy was not doing well. And I'm not, I remember the only job I, opportunity I had was uh, to sell vacuum cleaners or to be the assistant to the assistant at a gas station. I can't remember. It was something ridiculous. And uh, so there wasn't a lot of opportunities, but eventually, um, and I had continued on my education after that, just as it just fit well. Um, we ended up going on to, uh, to work for RBC and I got very fortunate and um, I, I jumped into a 95 working for uh, the bank down in, in St. Catharines and uh, moved to Hamilton and then I started moving all over different places. Um, and, uh, that, that experience working for a large organization, um, what it did for me was it taught me, um, I think from a, from a large, large business perspective, it also taught me though about the client experience because the bank was really good at that. And that 25 years, I was entrenched a lot of great jobs, a lot of unique things. I would say the bank is, is highly recommended as a bank to work for. Um, but what was missing was I wanted that thrill, the challenge to do it. And I had started my business, but I was still working for RBC and they allowed me sort of to do this on the side. And as I, as my business, which started off as a hobby became a bit larger and larger and larger. Um, it then afforded me the decision to say, um, I really just want to take this on full time. And my only regret was I should have, I should have done it a lot earlier. I wish I was 21 years old again, um, because I think, my goodness, the opportunity would have been tremendously different. But, you know, the answer to your question of, you know, when you have a traditional job that you work nine to five with, you have, you, you're going to get certain great um, feelings from that job. You're going to have certain things that you enjoy. You're going to learn an awful lot. But when you start to see the being an entrepreneur, being your own boss, making your own decisions, uh, growing your own brand, the thrill, the excitement, the passion that you, you get from that, it's, it's unlike anything else. Um, you know, and, and the freedom, um, the freedom that I can do this anywhere in the world. Um, you know, we're going away in July. And, uh, you know, I, I, my, my is a teacher, uh, so she's limited to her, uh, her, her, her vacation time. But I'm like, we can go away for a month. Uh, I can just work wherever it is. And that freedom to have that um, is just, it's unparalleled. And so I, I love it. Um, an entrepreneur, yes, it can be scary. Yes, things can go sour. Um, and I've always, so, and being a banker, I always put my risk adverse hat on. I always would say, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Um, and then I would manage to the worst possible thing. And if I am okay with the worst possible thing, then everything else will be fine. And, and so, um, and, and my, my wife would always would say, you know, everything's gonna be okay at the end of the day. And if, if it's not okay, it's not the end. And so you just keep on growing from that. So um, you do get worried. I would say at times you have to be, you get anxious, there's no question. But that's where having, again, I, I have very fortunate in my support network. Um, one was certainly my wife, who was very supportive of our business venture. And it was our business venture because you go in this together, the family. Um, but also, too, I think I had some really good mentors at work um, who had left um, their, their different jobs that I called upon. And when I was having my crazy days where I felt like I was going to rip my hair out, um, I'd pick up the phone and call them. And, and we would just work things out. And remember, if, if, if it's things aren't good, it's not the end. There's still more chapters be written. It's interesting, you know, one of the biggest lessons I was ever taught, uh, and as I moved into this side, side of my career too, is to always have your own personal board of directors. Always <laughs> have a person that, you know, always have three or four people that you know that you can count on for different reasons. Maybe one is emotional. Maybe one is a workout friend. Maybe one is the financial friend. Maybe one is a leadership person that you look up to. And it's, it's something that, that we will often tell our new entrepreneurs is find yourself a board of directors, find yourself that mentoring group that, that isn't, you know, isn't just your best friend. And, and it could be your wife or your husband or your partner, but it also could be people that you've 
learn so much from in the past. And that's something that, you know, Stephen, I'm really glad that you've echoed that too, because in our teaching in the center, we are always saying, find that board of directors, find that team of supporters that you can really lean on and know what parts you can lean on specific people for as well. And uh, uh, yep. it's really, really important that way. Awesome. No, it really is. So when did you know, Stephen, when did you know that, you know, maybe I don't need to go yeah. back and work at the bank? Maybe, maybe I can make a go of this. Maybe, maybe this is the path. And I, and I did sort of validate that, that decision that, that I made, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Was there a specific time or is there a day, a moment, um, or did it just sort of evolve naturally? I think it's always going to evolve naturally. I think that you're, for me, it was how I was feeling, um, what excited me more. Uh, 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 I say this loosely: filling at a GL or or um, or or selling a skincare product to a client. I mean, I got more excited over the transaction of a, of a sale with a client. I think that to me, I just started to realize it. I, obviously, you know, everyone's going to be in a different position from a, a financial security perspective. Um, for me, it was an easier decision because, I, again, I had 25 years on my belt. I've had five to seven years of success on Amazon. So I built up a, a, a situation where financially I knew the risk was, was, was lower. And um, it, again, that worst case scenario was still okay. And, and I think that for me, it was making that decision. Um, and everyone's going to be different. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. If I was uh, younger, uh, just starting out, if I have nothing to lose, they have nothing to lose, right? And so that's it. You know, you got to understand where you are in your journey of life. Um, to, so, so it was just, again, for me, it was just financially, I was in a position where I could make that decision. Um, and then I, what, what excited me the most? It, you know, and we will often say too, and I really appreciate you saying that, you know, many entrepreneurs will fail two or three times before they succeed. And many entrepreneurs will feel failure. And, and, and you know, the real challenge for young entrepreneurs in, in, in general is it's okay to be a serial one. It's okay to want to try it again. And it's okay to come back with a new idea or a repackaged similar idea. It's, you know, if, if this is really what you want to do, there's, there's something out there for you. And uh, yeah. you know, Often people will say, well, you know, entrepreneurship isn't an occupation and I'll just sort of roll my eyes and say, well, you know, you don't have these wrinkles and everything else, right? But, but it really is. And it's okay to be an entrepreneur. It's okay to have a product and, and it's okay to start, you know, be your only employee for five, 10, 15 years, whatever the heck it's going to be. Because if you enjoy it and it's your passion, well, you've got something there. And it's something that we always want to tell our entrepreneurs, whether you're a millionaire or whether you're making $30,000 on this thing, uh, you're still going and you're still doing it pretty well. Well, I, I, this is why I'm a bit of a plug in for, the, for the, the Center of Entrepreneurship, because I think the program that you've developed and, and are teaching is, in my mind, is world class. Um, and, and, and I've been to a lot of uh, programs and I've, I've, I've different schools. And um, there's no question that what you're developing and sharing and bring in to the students. I don't think maybe they, maybe everyone in this room does realize it, but if not, I can tell you guys are getting the best education out there. And 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 whether or not you are, are grooming yourself to become a CEO of a large company, um, whether or not you're grooming yourself to uh, create this new invention and solve the world and be the CEO of that, or you know it could be a, a business like mine that you want to grow. Um, but I also think too, it also could be a lot of trades. You think about, you know, where the world is going today with the lack of trades. And, you know, I, I, I know so many folks who are excellent trades people, but they suck as a business person, right? And, and they always say, oh, geez, you know, I really don't want to go out and run my own company. I said, you don't want to go out every day and slug it uh, in the trenches for 12 or the day. What you want is get 12 fleets and let other people slug it for you, right? And, and so, you know, as you become maybe an expert in, in that trade, uh, don't, don't think about how many 10 hours I'll get paid X dollars. Think about how many trucks can I own and get out there and, and, uh, and rule this part of, of the world, right? So that's where I think there's so much everyone can learn from. It's, it's incredible that you would say that because we are doing a lot more work with our skilled trades groups and our skilled trade programs now that we were before. And 
you know, before I came back to academics, I worked for a company called Carstar. And they, these were collision stores. And, you know, we had over 600 across North America, probably 400 were owned by independent people that, that used to paint cars or fix cars. Uh, they wanted to be their own boss. So they bought the store or it was from their father or their, their mother, whatever it was. The biggest obstacle there was exactly what you said. I, I used to travel North America and say, you know, are you, are you the boss or are you the CEO? You can't be either. You can't be, you, have, you can't be both. And by saying that it meant exactly what you said is get yourself to a position where you don't need to be the one painting the cars, but learn more about business so that you don't resort back to painting cars when things aren't going very well. Cause that's often what entrepreneurs will do as well is if they're not going well, they'll go to where they're strong, which is human natural. Uh, yep. it's, it's human nature to go and do that. But um, you know, we're seeing now in the skilled trades environment, as well as a family owned business environment, that there's a lot of opportunity for people that are motivated to either buy a family business or take one over or run it better than their father or mother did. And, and we Absolutely. often are seeing that too. And, and uh, generations only get better with how they treat people and how they run businesses. They, they rarely get worse. And we're seeing that right now as well. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. So, you know, it, it's been a while. You've, it's been a crazy ride. I don't think you would have thought 25 years ago, you'd be talking to me about skincare and about, about running a business. <laughs> um, you know, what, you know, one of the things in, in speaking before we went on camera about, about, you know, your next few months and, and, and what you're up to these days, what is next for you? Um, when will you know that, that you're satisfied? When will you know that it's, it's okay to step back? And, and where do you see your business and also yourself personally being in five or 10 years? Uh, many really good questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer that in different phases. So phase one, enjoy life. Um, I think we all have experiences of people that we know or are close to us or, or situations where um, you know, the latter half of the lives was just maybe their health wasn't there. And, and they, and they always said, geez, why did they like, why couldn't they have enjoyed those years instead of, you know, uh, doing something I, I didn't want to do. Um, so for me, um, I'm not really anywhere near the close retirement and, and I can tell you that. Um, but I, I would say this will become a point in time and, and whether it's five to seven years that I am going to sit back and enjoy what, I, what, what I've created enjoy my family around me. Um, doesn't mean I won't be volunteering. It doesn't mean I won't be, hopefully that unless they get rid of me, a part of the board of directors still, cause I love doing that stuff. Um, I can't go anywhere. I enjoy talking I, I, too much. I love that volunteer part. So yeah. I will continue doing that. But um, in the meantime, in the meantime, I, I said earlier, I taken this company from zero sales to where we're doing more than $10 million. I want to see this to be a hundred million dollar company. Um, at that, to get there, I can't do this alone. It, it takes a, a village to raise a family at this point in time. And so I've made sure that, you know, part of my strategic uh, thinking going forward is to ensure that I have the right partners to help me grow, to help me scale up even larger. We scaled well, we've done well. Um, I do think it's a tip of the iceberg and I think there's more opportunity. So I want to continue this to grow. I, I, it won't happen as quick as it happened before. I mean, things do take, when you get to a certain level, um, then you got it. But I believe in abundance. So what I mean by that is that, you know, maybe this might be an, an end question, but I, I would say that don't ever worry about the moment of what you're going to sell or how you're going to sell it. Start thinking about the larger picture. Vision what your life will look like. Um, vision what you want it to be. And for me right now, I'm envisioning this $100 million business. I'm envisioning um, that uh, we have a greater line of products that, you know, we, we talked a bit about my demographics being a little bit older. There's a huge market opportunity for millennials and, and coming down market. So how do I engage sort of or win both sides of this? Um, how do I then compete better with the, the, the L'Oreal's? And, and, you know, I, I got to start, you know, start thinking about what that might look like. Um, but I, I, I am envisioning that and then I'll, well, when I work, I chunk towards of, of getting there. Um, and you've always got to make decisions and steps to do so. So that's what I plan to do. Um, uh, I, 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 and I think once I, and if that takes me five years, that's perfect because that's probably when I would want to sit back and just enjoy maybe a little bit more with my family. I think too, when I, you know, I really appreciate the words because as you, as you say these things, I make notes to link them back to some of the things that we teach our students. And one of the things that 
that we will often talk about is the fact, you know, is, is the need to have two things. Uh, number one, metrics, know your metrics, know your sales. Yep. Um, you know, I can't tell how many times in my old career, I would have someone trying to sell me something and I would ask them a question about metrics and I, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know where their market was. They wouldn't know what their sales are. They wouldn't know what their costs were. And I used to think to myself, you know, I'm buying that person as much as I'm buying the product. If I can't put my trust in their knowledge, I can't buy the product. And so it, it's an interesting experience. And interesting you would say that. Next is have goals. You know, whether it's to get from 1,000 to 5,000, whether it's get from the, to 1,000 to 100 million, whatever it is, know where you're going. And, and, and that's something that I think in early stages of young entrepreneurs' visions and their, their careers, they just want to pay a bill. They just want to pay the rent. They just want to, you know, have a, have a credit card with a balance that, that isn't going to scare them. And those are those things. But if those are your goals, Stephen, then have them. Make that your goal. And, and that's really, you know, to me, what we're trying to teach a lot of our young entrepreneurs is, is it doesn't matter what the goal is. Um, be lofty, be ambitious, but, but, but make them and, and set them. And that's something that we've always talked about. And then you can always work, like I I often do the work backwards mentality. Okay, so I want to be here. How do I work backwards to get there? I love that. I actually made a note on that. I think that's been, I think that's a fantastic, fantastic thing because entrepreneurs have to be bold. They have to be brave. And that saying in 20 years, I will do this. Well, it gives you that roadmap and maybe you don't, but maybe you came, you came really close and then that's okay too. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that. That's uh, I think that'll be something that we'll snip and we'll say, you know, is be bold, be courageous, and work backwards. Is set that vision and then and then and then again go because I think that's, you know, we find that a lot of students right now are looking for instant gratification because we we live in a clicker generation and we're not as patient as we used to be. Um, it's okay for a goal to be a month from now. It's okay for it to be ten years from now. Have it and work backwards, as you said. I think that's a fantastic point. I really do. Awesome. It's interesting. So, so let's do this. I always like to end these things and, and you, you sort of said you had one, but I'm going to ask you for another one. Um, you know, the one tip that you might give uh, a young entrepreneur that's either starting out or, or perhaps even sitting there right now thinking, you know what, I've always wanted to try this. I wasn't really sure. Do I have something? What's that one thing you would say? I'm going back to that one word. It goes back to resilience. And I'm going to link that to what the Nike thing. Just do it. Uh, honestly, I see so many people, and I've gone on so many conferences where people would gather and they all want to do something, whether it's start their own business, whether um, it's to, to, to get maybe sell something on Amazon. And then I re-engage with them a year later. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I, and I, I sit myself, oh my God, that's the problem. Problem is, is that people... And, and they allow the, they don't prioritize in their lives. So there's no question, you know, we talked about this earlier, we, we both have kids, Ryan, and, and, and there's gonna be bumps and bruises and we're gonna have partners out there that we're gonna have bumps and bruises. And then there's gonna be that bill you can't, there's always gonna be something, okay? So put that aside because life will tell us there's always gonna be something. What you need to do is there's only two things in life that we are limited to, our time and money. Money will come, so it's our time. Our time is the most important thing. And we only have 24 hours in the day, no matter if you're the paper boy or you're, you're, you're the president of the United States, we still have 24 hours, right? So it's just how do you prioritize that better? And, and you just have to go out and do it. I started with $1,000 because I went out and I did it. I started with something and then I built up from there. I think that, you know, when, when any entrepreneur, wherever you are at your journey, uh, always reflect back and you say, how many times did I say I'll get to it? Stop that. Just stop it, right? You need to just focus and go forward. And if you do fall, you pick yourself up again and you try one more time, okay? Um, and then you're going to fall again. And then you just keep on course correcting and pivoting until you get it right. Um, if I would have given up a long time ago, I never would have be, be here today. I would be probably, you know, working my nine to five job and slugging it out, uh, driving every day downtown Toronto. Uh, now, now life is different for me, right? And I, and 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 I'm happier that way. Um, I, it took courage, but it takes resilience. So resilience and just freaking do it. <laughs> I guess the best way to put it. 
my grandfather would always say, why not now? He would always say that to me. And that's much what you're saying, isn't it, Stephen, is why not now? Just just go and do it because you may not do it tomorrow. So that's uh, that's fantastic. I really yeah. appreciate those words. So, well, Stephen, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And I, I, I you know, we've been looking forward to chatting for, for a while now. And, and I know I really appreciate you being involved with the center. Uh, I really appreciate you being willing to, to share your story with 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 our attendees as well, because you know, every single one of the stories that our students hear, I know they relate to, uh, if not now, then later. So uh, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, for everyone out there, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. And, uh, and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thanks so much and congratulations, everyone.